Greetings to all my subscribers. I've got an exciting guest on today. I thought it uh, might be time for me to bring on a guest who was a bit younger than me. Uh, so I thought that might be fun, a bit more attractive to look at as well, I have to say. Uh, so uh, she is an expert, very, very experienced in the field of finance and the field of money. Uh, and I'm very keen to uh, get as much expertise out of her as I can. I've uh, been watching her shows and interviews for quite some time, and I think you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, she's a, obviously a gold bug like me and a gold bull, I think, as well, you might add uh, to that. Uh, so we're just going to sort of pick up a few things, uh, and not in necessarily any order of priority, uh, but as I say, I'm very keen uh, to see... Uh, the the views from the other side of the pond uh, and uh, and and what makes what makes the general public tick in response to what's happening because I know what's going on here and I'll share that with with the net probably a little bit as well. So one of the major things there's a number of major problems that we're having at the moment uh, and it's difficult to know where to start. But I think perhaps let's start with inflation. Uh, just inflation which kicks off everything else whether it's banking fiat currencies and all the rest of it so um uh inflation now lynette tell me what is the perception of the american public over there because here uh inflation is regarded as an act of god it you know it's it's it's, it's something that you can't do anything about uh it's just a complete and total mystery uh and so uh, nobody really takes any notice of it uh, and of course, uh, when they speak fondly of, uh, oh, well, you could buy a pint of beer uh, uh, in those days, because you could buy it for just, you know, uh, 12 pence or 13 pence. And now it's five pounds. They think that that's just an act of God. They don't understand that inflation is created. Is that the same perception over there in America, that it's just something that you have to live with like bad weather? Well, I don't think people understand inflation, uh, and which is why they baked it into the very system. However, when it rises quickly and they notice the difference between 12 pence and five pounds, and that happens in a short period of time, people notice no matter where they are. But um, I think in some ways they expect that it's an act of God, but the reality is it's, it's all the money, it's free money printing that's what devalues the currency and especially in a debt-based system. So I think people right now, most of the people are very unhappy with the level of inflation and our government can't understand why the general population is still so upset because after all, inflation is coming down. That's just the rate and speed of the price increases but if you go to the grocery store every week, a couple times a week, it's very noticeable. So I, I don't think that they think that it's an actual act of God, but I don't think they really understand where it comes from. But you know what's scarier than that, Godfrey? Is the fact that we had our, our central banker here, Jay Powell, and we had Christine Lagarde over across the pond, admitting that they don't understand inflation either. And they're the ones that are driving the bus. So that's a little unnerving that they don't understand it. Well, this, of course, is absolutely right. The, the politicians and central bank, they don't seem to understand how it how it's come about. But, right. but, but one of the things we have, and of course, uh, is this modern monetary theory, which, of course, where... Politicians and civil servants and commentators seem to think that if you spend more money than you own as an individual, uh, or if your little business uh, doesn't earn enough money to pay its bills, you go broke. But that can't happen uh, to a country. But they don't seem to understand uh, that countries can go broke. Uh, they don't necessarily have to close down. They just print more money to get out of it. And of course, you've got uh, you've got people which always stagger me as a professional, like Paul Krugman, who simply uh, sells lots of books and is so fascinatingly wrong about everything he says 
one wonders we, we've got them over here i'm not having a pop at america we've got them over here we've got a man called professor will hutton who teaches uh economics at oxford who is equally stupid uh, and doesn't understand it uh, and of course uh, and, and of course people ask me and i'm sure they ask you well if we owe all this money to whom do we owe it uh, and of course paul krug was saying, well we owe it to ourselves well who are ourselves of course it's our pension funds. It's our life insurance companies. Like it doesn't matter that we are, we owe it supposedly to ourselves. Um, how can this change over in America? How, how I, you're working very hard. There's lots of people working very hard. How are we going to? And over here, how are we going to change this perception that somehow um, you can print money and get away with it uh, and without consequence? And that that's still they're still printing. They're going to print more. Well. I mean, of course, because they only have interest rates and money printing. Those are the only tools that the central banks have. But I think people definitely start to notice when inflation is higher and they can see those prices go up more quickly and it's more obvious. If the central banks can keep that loss of purchasing power to 2%, well, look, at they've gotten a lot of our purchasing power over the years, people don't realize that in this country in 1971, the average wage was $9,500, but a family of four could live with one wage earner. Now, I'm not saying they were super flush, but they only needed one wage earner to, to indeed support a family of four. Today, the average wage is like $58,000. And so, most people would say, well, Joe, I'd much rather have 58,000 than 9,500. But it takes two wage earners to make that enough money. And then they're paycheck to paycheck. And the, they're taking on more and more and more debt because that is what, in, what is encouraged. So what it's going to take is rapid inflation. And that's why they talk about inflation expectations, right? It's and I I even heard Jay Powell say this the other day uh, in front of the Banking Senate Committee, and he said, "Well, he said it's all about expectations. So if the public expects inflation to be at two percent, it will be at two percent. Well, except you keep doing this, that's not going to keep it at two percent. And and I'll tell you something else about inflation that I think is so flipping fascinating. What's happening right now?" is for the longest time since the great financial crisis, we have seen a synchronized move in global central banks to whether they're raising rates, et cetera. Now we are seeing that decoupling. So we have some central banks that are raising rates, other central banks that have started to lower the rates. They don't have the inflation under control because there's too much of this junk out there floating around. And not enough of this junk, well, this is not junk, this sound money in order to counter that. But yeah, rapid inflation, people notice and then they lose confidence. And I know you and I have been watching the layers of confidence in this con game being stripped away. And I just find this incredibly fascinating because in 2008, it was bank to bank confidence when the banks didn't loan money to the other banks and interbank lending. It went to zero, right? So that was a layer of loss of confidence. And then in 2015, it was central bank to central bank with the Swiss surprise and the Swiss franc being pegged to the euro so that and that was about mortgages. And we can get into that if you want to. But the Swiss central bank kept promising and vowing that keeping that peg was the most important policy that they had. And they were coming out every day. And then two days after they said, this is the single most important policy, bam, they pulled the Swiss surprise and they depegged from the Euro. And that showed that all central banks that they couldn't really trust the other central bank to continue to be in lockstep. So that was the beginning of that weakening. And then it was what, I think June 22nd last year, or no, 22, when the central, well, the Federal Reserve kept saying 50 basis point increase, 50 basis point, 50 basis point. And then all of a sudden they did a 75 
basis point move. So the markets realized that that policy that they had in place of forward guidance that they put in place in 2008, that they couldn't really trust the central banks anymore. So I see a bunch of decoupling happening because we're looking at the bond market, which is the debt market, which is how all this stuff is created. And we're watching the markets disagree with the Fed. So it used to be don't fight the Fed. Well, it looks like the markets are fighting the Fed and it looks like there's a decoupling in the policies on a global basis, central bank to central bank. I think we are at such a fragile, fragile period of time right now that one misstep with all of the garbage that's in the system, all the leverage and all the debt and, and all of the derivatives of big bets, you know, I, I think that easily the central banks could be overwhelmed in their ability to print their way out of this mess. And, and that could happen anytime. I don't know when, but that can happen anytime. When I did my professional exams, which was a long time ago, that was back in the 1960s, <clears throat> um, there was a few concepts uh, around which were taken as the economic fundamental as well. And there aren't many economic fundamentals. There aren't many economic laws, uh, but there are a few. Uh, and one was that only zero inflation uh, was a good thing. You know, it had to be zero because once you allowed, let's say you've got you're aiming for two percent, you can't do that because once the inflation gene is out of the bottle, uh, you you can't stuff it back in. And I tell the undergraduates when I was lecturing at universities and uh, uh, with my little coin, which I don't have in my pocket at the moment, which I normally do if I'm lecturing, and that is um, that's a sovereign, a gold sovereign. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, what is interesting, the one I actually happen to have in my pocket normally, when I'm talking, is it happens to be a, a 1905 sovereign with a, with with uh, with the King Edward VII face on it. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But the point I make to them is that sovereign would buy you bed and breakfast in a reasonably good hotel in London, Berlin, Paris or New York in 1905. And it will today. And it will today because the 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 uh, cash value of that in in pounds sterling uh, is about four hundred pounds. And mm -hmm. if you go when we went back onto the gold standard after the Battle of Waterloo uh, in eighteen fifteen, which incidentally the French think they still won, but they didn't win anyway. Leaving that aside, um, uh, we went back onto the sovereign. We're back, the sovereign turned up, and it was the gold standard. Yes, uh, and a loaf of bread in eighteen sixteen. A loaf of bread, which you might argue is the core, uh, the, the the sort of core commodity uh, mm -hmm. of the Industrial Revolution, beginning of the Industrial Re Revolution. That was the core value. Uh, and a, a loaf of bread was exactly the same price in 1913. So the, the price of a loaf of bread hadn't changed in very nearly 100 years. Uh, and so when you get onto the uh, a gold standard of, uh, of that sort, uh, and of course, there's another thing that uh, uh, that uh, you'll be very familiar with. If you say, perhaps in the 20th century, that the core commodity was oil, which is not an unreasonable thing. If you look at the if you look at the history of the last hundred years of oil and gold, you'll find they flatline. So you've got you've got 200 years basically of 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 being gold being your total hedge against inflation. And so when you come off that, uh, this is when you get your problems. But, of course, none of our debt, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan in particular at the moment, uh, America, the debts are impossible to be repaid. So where are we going now? We, we can't go on. It's one of these things, Lynette, isn't it? We can't go on as we are. Right. But it's always impossible to change anything. So, so what's your take? What's your view? How, how do you think you, we can dig ourselves? Both our nations can dig ourselves out. Well, there were a few things in there, Godfrey. So I'm going to kind of unpack this a little bit um, because, frankly, um, can can I have my one dollar gold coin back? Okay, I want to show you something since you brought this up, and I think it's really interesting. Thank you. Okay, so here's a one an ounce of silver, one dollar silver dollar. This little teeny weeny thing here is the one dollar U.S. gold coin, and then of course there's well. This isn't, here's a dollar bill. And then there's a dollar bill. In 1913, you could buy 11 loaves of bread with any any one of those. Take your pick. 
Today, you get maybe, maybe a quarter of a loaf of bread with this. You still get 11 loaves of bread with this, but with this, you get 135 loaves. So just to make your point on the bread, we can see how this gets devalued into nothing. And there are 4,800 currencies of which I have like a bunch of them here that don't exist anymore because if the government can say, this is money, well, what's the difference between this monopoly money and this? You accept it, you accept it to work for it and use it as your tool of barter and attempt to save it. But like I just showed you, you can't save this and that's by design. So I think it's critically important for people to get that because at the end of the day, all assets and all instruments end up at their true fundamental value. And for this, it's zero. For these two, silver and gold, physical silver and gold, in terms of currency, it can be like, I just did a debt to amount of gold uh, calculation the other day. Globally, if we were to reset the currency, because that's what's going to happen. If we were to reset the currency for all of this stuff that's been created around the world, you'd see spot if it were reflecting true supply and demand and fundamental value at $40,000. So even at 2,300, 2,500, 10,000, 20,000, it's still severely undervalued because inflation is an invisible, almost invisible tax on the population that they don't have to take to legislation and make it obvious. And as you said, to begin with, people think that that's just the way that it is, but that's not. It's because of all the easy money printing. And what a gold standard does is it creates restriction around how much debt and how much spending a government can do. And the other thing that was interesting to me is you, you were studying all of that in the 60s. And what was also happening in the 60s, besides the energy crisis, et cetera, is that the U.S. had been exporting inflation to the rest of the world, and the rest of the world knew it. And so there was actually a run on the dollar in the 60s with foreign governments, or non-U.S. governments, I'll say, sending in their dollars in exchange for the gold. And if, if President Nixon and I was there in 72 or 72, 75, and that was when President Nixon was being impeached at that time. So it's really interesting for those conversations back then going down, back down memory lane. But the reality is, is that if all you're holding is this, they fool you with nominal confusion because you get blinded by numbers. Look at Zimbabwe. $10 trillion times zero, if it has no purchasing power value, it's still zero. So they use inflation in the stock markets, in the real estate markets, in the bond markets. They use that to hide what's really happening, which is the loss of purchasing power and this experiment's life cycle. I've been studying currency life cycles since 1987 when I was a stockbroker at Shearson. And what I discovered then, because I'm, I'm looking, I had to study all the currencies and all of the patterns, and you just see these repeatable patterns. And I think a great example is that I have a nine-year-old granddaughter, and I'm going to be 70 this year. I guarantee you she's at a different point in her life cycle than I am in mine. And you are not going to look at me and go, oh, well, maybe she's going to be 10 years old next year. Just like you're not going to look at her at nine and go, oh, well, maybe she's going to be 70. So I, I believe so strongly that if you can learn to recognize the patterns of the life cycle, like we can with our own aging, that you'll know where we are in this currency's life cycle and have the ability to get into position to survive this 
but also thrive through this because inflation is a wealth transfer mechanism. And the way that that countries that have taken on too much debt, get rid of that debt, is they repay it by hyperinflating away the currency and repaying it with debt that has no value. Will the population notice that? And I personally strongly believe because of the monetary velocity chart, which is the number of times that money changes hands, and it's an indication of where, where we are in this cycle, in the U.S., and I'll bet you this is true all over, actually, if I looked at it, but in the U.S., we have now had a very pervasive spike up in the number of times that money changes hands, which for me is an indication that we're already at the beginning stages of the hyperinflation because people don't want to hold on to these. Because of the inflation, they don't want to spend them as quickly as possible, which is exactly what happens during hyperinflation. As an Austrian school economist, as I am, of course, uh, we would call that will be not the crack up boom. But the last yeah. thing you want is paper money. You buy anything virtually, uh, almost anything. But you want stuff, as the Americans would call it. You want stuff. You don't yeah. want paper. Um, <laughs> but yeah. the there's a couple of things here. Um, we we adopted the welfare state in uh, 1945, uh, which, of course, in my view, was is the cancer in a nation's soul, the something for nothing idea, uh, where the state will take responsibility for the family, which is totally alien to both our countries. Uh, and this came about in 1945. And of course, socialism seems to have come in welfareism in almost through the back door in America. Um, it's sort of grown without anybody banging a political drum. It's just a bit more here and a bit more there and a bit more there. Medicare, Obamacare, none of which I understand or anybody over here understands, really. Nobody understands. Um, it no, means it's, you more. It's a, it's a mystery. The other thing is, so we've got this problem of welfareism. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And the other problem, of course, in, 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 in your country is an almost 1890s approach, Prussian approach to militarism. Uh, if you look through history, you'll find that only uh, in recent history, modern history, you'll find that um, only Prussia in the 1890s and, and the early 1900s had this approach, you know, si an army of six million, uh, the race to build more dreadnoughts and battleships and all the rest of it, for no apparent reason. Uh, there was no real reason for this. And of course, we're seeing this now uh, which is adding and fueling American debt, uh, mm -hmm. which is very disappointing and destabilizing a lot of the world. Right. What what the problem is, another thing is that people don't seem to understand from my old days uh, of uh, exams and, uh, and so on and so forth, is people don't seem to understand, and I include most of the press, so the press are woefully uh, economically illiterate. Uh, they are, particularly over here, uh, you know, they're, they're really hopeless. I mean, they they can't string a conversation together. Uh, but the people don't seem to understand the difference between capitalism and mercantilism, as we used to call it, sometimes referred to as crony capitalism. We don't have capitalism. It was always a favor of capitalism. We don't have capitalism, do we? Um, no. I would suggest uh, that we haven't seen capitalism in the last hundred years, except in Ho Hong Kong under John Cooperthwaite. Pure laissez-faire capitalism and everybody does well out of it, because if you don't get out of bed in the morning and do a day's work, you've got an empty belly. And at the yeah. end of the day, that's what life's all about. Yes, it, it's what we all want. And, you know, we think we've been taught that this is a capitalist country, but it's not. And, and nor is it a democracy anymore. Uh, we've got a combination kind of government that has is really quite heavy handed. I mean, I've been watching over all these years, the, our rights just being whittled down, whittled down, whittled down. And when they do it slowly enough, you know, people think these things just happen overnight. They don't, they couldn't because they, it's like the frog in the pot of water. So they make these changes to your point through the back door around the other side and really since the 70s, since we really, the U.S. handed over control of inflation 
to the global, to the central bank. And what do banks know? You know, they know interest, they know debt, and their job is not to take care of the public. That's what they want us to think. Their job is to protect themselves and the banking system. And so we've watched all of the markets. I've watched all of the markets globally become all financial products. To your point, there's no real capitalism left because it's all been crony capitalism that the central banks and the governments have chosen the winners and they've chosen the losers. And who's too big to fail? Not the public, except the whole reason why I'm here today is because what you and I are doing together is creating community. And that's, you know, that's what we have to do. We have to come together on two levels of community, a local community, because during these transitions, these reset transitions into a new system, which we have to because the old system is dead. Uh, but during these transitions, food becomes the single biggest issue for people. And we can see that around the globe. Food has become a huge issue. So food, water, energy, security, barterability, which I like this for, wealth preservation, which I like this and this for, community and shelter. And frankly, we are running out of time. I, I can't tell you Tuesday morning at 8.35, but it could be, you know. So we need to come together in local community so that we can sustain, bring all of our different talents and skills and assets together and sustain a reasonable standard of living Get to know who grows your food, get to know, you know, go out, do a day's labor at a farm, create that relationship, but a local community to survive this. And then a global community, as we were talking earlier about having a voice at the table in this new digital CBDC iteration of money, because if we don't, if we don't hold wealth invisible wealth that's outside of the system, if we allow central bankers that are already, do, I mean, this is their job is to rob us. And, and what do they say? Once we have the digital currency, and these are their words, not mine, they say there are, are no limits to how low we can push interest rates because obviously negative rates are a choice which is ridiculous because, you know, why would you work so hard, loan somebody money and accept less than what you gave them to begin with, unless they were their, your children? That That's the only people that I would do that for, you know, so. so I have a, I, I totally agree. We uh, People say when I've done a, sometimes if I've done a lecture, I mean, what can do, what's the doing thing? How can we, you know, it's doom and gloom a little bit. And I say, well, really the best thing you can do is is to look after you and your family first because you're not going to change the system by voting for anybody else because it's a unipolar system make sure that you are okay and your family's okay uh, and as you quite rightly say gather around you a local uh, a more local thing which of course if you go back uh, if you go back in history, how it always was, you go back to the Anglo-Saxon times, uh, Alfred the Great and, and so on and so forth. And if you go back to your uh, uh, pre-Civil War, we didn't have a civil war. You had a North versus South. It wasn't a civil war. Uh, but you have uh, the problem there, of course, is um, the power of the states was eroded and the power of the Constitution I would suggest, a bit impertinent of me, if you'll excuse me, um, as an Englishman, uh, I think uh, I think the book that your excellent constitution, which I think is a first class document, started to be abandoned in 1861. And I think that's where you can almost trace the problems to. A wonderful document. Our Bill of Rights is an excellent document, a toleration act. They're not, uh, they're not written down in the same way, but of course, your constitution was based on the 1688 Bill of Rights here, and that's what the Americans wanted, and that's why they broke away to have that. Wonderful. It's wonderful. And it's been completely it's been completely abandoned. I think that's a and that is, of course, a terrible shame. Tell us, Lynette, if you will, um, 
And this is something that is uh, uh, I've heard you before on this subject, and uh, I think it's uh, it's very enlightening. And I learned a bit from it as well, because it's not my, quite my area of expertise. Tell us about tokenization. Tell us about this tokenization. It, can you explain, bear in mind that uh, my subscribers, and on this subject, a little bit like myself, are slightly new to this. So if you can keep it baby talk, that would be helpful. Uh, yes. And, and this is the direction that we are going in where everything, if they have their way, Every single asset that you have, your equity in it, and I'm pointing to this cup because it includes even a cup, would be turned into a digital token and broken down into small increments, which I don't have my phone in here, but then you carry your wealth on your phone. And we become, uh, in the US, we started consumerism in the 20s. But the whole world is turning into a big consumer economy and they're counting on people taking on debt and buying stuff. So they it's called nudging, you know, in this country, and I'm sure this is true globally, the governments and the central bankers employ the most brilliant psycho psychological minds to help nudge you. It's actually called perception management. And they can inspire you to sell all of your equity. But when it's in a token, then that can go around the world. So you might have all the equity in your home. Now you've got this equity on a phone in little teeny digits, a dollar or a pound a piece, right? And you're out shopping and you see this boat that you want to buy. And, you know, you know, you've got money right there. You don't even have to go get a loan. You don't have to do anything. You just spend it. And so in this way, through tokenization, and there's good and bad. There's always good and bad to everything. Because you can execute the same strategy as the, the wealthy, the 1% would do, which is if you're smart, you won't fall for that and you'll accumulate more wealth, right? But most people won't realize that they then sell off all of their equity and there we go. We're in compliance with what the World Economic Forum wants, which is you own nothing. And we go back to the feudal system where you just have a few people that own everything and everybody else has to rent. And guess who gets to choose those prices and, and what that looks like? It's the person that owns all the assets. So be the, actually, this is what I use for wealth transfer. Be the person that owns the assets. That's really a big part of how you take care of your family. Because you're right. A lot of it sounds like doom and gloom, but it's not really doom and gloom. It's opportunity if you were in the right place at the right time with the right asset and you understand what's happening simply by watching the patterns shift. There are just some key patterns. We've essentially lost all the purchasing power in this. I mean, what, what's a dollar? What's a pound? How much does a pound buy you? Like, like nothing, right? And here in the US, I mean, you know, what is this? It, it's really just garbage. It's all it is. I can't do that with this because this is all utility. It's used in every single segment of the global economy. So is this, right? So this is universal money. This is local money. And, you know, it's going, it's, it's very close to zero now. And I do believe there's unfortunately not one down in my mind, but that we are headed to a hyperinflationary depression because they have to get rid of this that which is a debt-based paper-based system in order to go into the digital system and then turn all assets and register like they tried to do in Greece, register all of these assets so they know absolutely everything that you have. Will you agree to that? And how do you disagree? That's that, that, that. that. And of course, we come back, uh, well, PSYOPs, as you mentioned earlier, uh, 
we I think we saw in the COVID pandemic how vulnerable people were to this kind of nudging. Uh, especially, it was just the same here. It was just the same. Here. People, first of all, you make people fearful. And one of our great politicians from the left, actually, Anthony Wedgwood Ben, he said, first of all, you keep people badly educated in the dark so they don't know what's going on. Then you make them fearful. And then they're much easier to control. And if I, you could actually go back further and find Dr. Joseph Goebbels said much the same thing. I read his biography the other day. It's keeping people ignorant and fearful, which, of course, is frighteningly easy to do in the modern world. It seems to be frighteningly uh, easy to do. And just before we wind up, Lynette, I'd just like to, your view on one of the one of the great protections for the ordinary man, you call them Joe Sixpack, and we call them the man on the Clapham omnibus. Um, and he's the same man. He's he's a good citizen, working hard, doing his best for his family. The two protections there were the principles of law, English law over here, but very, very similar presumption of innocence, trial by jury, the things we have in common, which are quite a lot, uh, uh, the, 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 that principle, the principle of English law, and the other most important one might slightly argue one of the even more important uh, is a free press. Yes. We no longer have a free press or anything like it. You've got CNN, NBC, all the things you have. We have the BBC, we have Sky, purely and simply the government perspective. And yeah. who is the government? Not the people we elect. It's the World Economic Forum in the shadows, which consists of the World Economic Forum, the IMF, the Bank of International Set Settlements, the WHO. And who are their agents in this country, of course, as you'll probably know, and you've got your own agents over there, possibly not quite as deep as we have. Uh, we have the Prime Minister here, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Leader of the Opposition, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the King all share a WEF platform. Well, that the, and if you add psyops to that, you know the king comes on and and speaks to the nation and says it's a good idea that tokenization, uh, so on and so forth. Nobody's going to trust our politicians. The whole thing is extremely frightening. Mm -hmm. One wonders. I think there will always be survivors, but we're not trained. Your country and my country, our ordinary folk, aren't trained in critical thinking or risk assessment. Right. They don't know how to do critical thinking or risk assessment. Only 20% of the population over here really know how to do that. Everybody else goes with the flow. Same in America, is it, or perhaps not? Oh, I think it's the same in America, but I, I don't think we've got 20% <laughs> that understand this. I don't think we do. You know, I think that short-termism has... Yeah taken hold i mean if it didn't happen 10 seconds ago it's old news right Any, anything within 10 seconds whereas you learn a lot by looking at history because it has a tendency to repeat it has a tendency to rhyme and what we're dealing with is actually just a repetition of history um but but yes you're going to have the elites that have the wealth transfer their way because you brought up the King of England. And I actually bring up the King or Queen before um, quite a bit because what they've shown us all how to do is to create what's called dynastic wealth. And that's wealth that has lasted in families at least 300 years. And what are the pillars of dynastic wealth? Well, it's kind of like a stool and there's three legs to it. There is real estate. There are truly rare collectibles. And then there's gold as the foundation. You could do all three with gold, but arguably this is the most important part because you can accumulate those other two at the right time if you have this, because you're holding your purchasing power, as we talked about before. Exactly. And of course, the inference is certainly over here, and I'm sure it's true in America, um, the idea that real estate, and whether it's commercial or whether it's domestic, can only go one way. The property yeah. ladder. They, but I, but there's only one advantage. There aren't many advantages being an old geezer like me. I've seen it all before. I've exactly. seen the markets crash. I've seen the real estate markets crash. The people who run Wall Street and the city of London haven't really started shaving 
uh, you know, their, their children, really. And they think they talk about the property ladder. There's yes. snakes and ladders. It doesn't go up in a linear fashion, but you can't tell anybody that. But I've got a feeling uh, that they're going to learn that and they're going to learn it very soon because yes. all, all real estate is leveraged or leveraged, as you would call it over there. Uh, and so it's all it's all dependent or, or hostage to interest rates. Of course, I don't know. I, I, we'll wind up on this. Otherwise, we could quite easily be here till midnight. And very enjoyable it would be. Um, as I see it, my perception is that I don't see how interest rates can go down because nobody will buy the debt. Same here, gilts, we call it, T-bills, whatever you want to call it. Who would buy? Who would buy that? You know, who who would buy the junk? And of course, another thing is difficult to explain to some youngsters that if interest rates go up, the value of the bond goes down. That takes a bit of getting in, especially financial journalists don't understand that. <laughs> it's true. I use this chopstick to explain that, right? Interest rates go down, the value of the bonds go up. And we were in what, a 40 year trend where the interest rates were being pushed down artificially to to quote unquote stimulate make that debt more affordable but now it went the other way and um i'm going to disagree with you on the interest rates should not go down however we're already watching that shift because they need more to your earlier point they got to keep growing at the value of what's already out there goes down and and we will end up in a hyperinflationary depression but i do think that they're going to pivot push interest rates all the way down to zero again and then that's when the public will notice the hyperinflation the technicals are already telling me and i'm putting my neck on the line but i'm standing by it because i've been watching it and once you see it happen in a pervasive way you know it right and and what did Ernest Hemingway said when he when asked how he went bankrupt, he said slowly at first and then very fast. And so we're kind of at that slowly at first stage. And then one day we will wake up and it will it'll catch everybody off guard. Well, I'm totally with you on that. I uh I suppose I was thinking short short term. If, if interest rates go to zero, it's Armageddon anyway, isn't it? Really, it's, it, it, it really, doesn't make any difference. Markets are going to love it. I mean, look at Venezuela. They had in what 2013, 14, 15, I think they had the best performing stock market in the world. Of course, their currency was hyperinflating, and it's still in trouble, right? So. You know, it's that nominal confusion piece where people think about numbers. People probably thought I was out of my mind when I said, well, really, the true value of this right now is $40,000, right? Oh, there's not enough gold to back a currency. Yeah, it's just how much it's priced in in this junk, right? And Zimbabwe, I'm telling you, I've been watching Zimbabwe since, what, 2006? And uh, right now, like just a couple of days ago, they came out with a currency that's a basket of currencies. So it's similar to the IMF's SDR, which is a basket of currencies, a whole bunch of currencies put together, plus supposedly a component of gold. The question is going to be whether or not the public trusts it, because for me, this is the big thing. If it's not convertible, how do you know it's really there? Do you really trust what these people are saying? So like they came out recently, about a year or so ago, they, they did a physical one ounce coin. Well, who can afford that? Just the elites can afford that in that country. Then for the public, they came out with the CBDC backed by gold but you can't convert it in there. And they had trouble getting the public to adopt it. So now they've come out with a currency that's a basket of currency uh, currencies with a component of gold. Let me tell you, if that gets adopted, that is the first currency to reback 
their currency with gold. And frankly, if it were real, and I, I don't really think it is, but we'll see. Um, if it were real, you'd have the whole world running to that currency because everything else is just backed by debt. And this is debt, right? So okay. I'm watching Zimbabwe really closely and their experiments. And it's it's interesting. And what happened in 2020 was another. We, we Yeah, we could talk till midnight. Easy. Well, just finishing on that, then, because it says J.P. Morgan, wasn't it? I think in 1912, he said... Uh... Uh, only gold is money, everything else is debt. And of course, it's as true today as it was then. We don't seem to really move on, do we? But look, Lynette, I've taken an, enough of your time. It's very generous of you to give me your time. And I thank you very much for coming on. And I hope maybe in a few months' time, we might link up again um, well, to see just to see how things are developing. Um, I will make sure that uh, everything that you do, your links are there. Your links will be there, uh, so we can we you know my my people can get get to see you, uh, and press the right buttons, and uh, we'll do all that kind of thing as I always do, uh, for my interesting guests. Thank okay. you once again, uh, and uh, good luck in the future. Thank you, and and thank you for having me on your channel. This has been great fun, and I might just show up at your doorstep one of these days. I hope you will. Uh, as most of you know, my work is very heavily independently research-based uh, and I get my information from all over the world. It would help if you press the subscribe button and the little bell next to it because the more subscribers I have, uh, the more likely it is that international uh, independent research institutes will share their material with me. It's most helpful and then of course I'll automatically share it with you. Uh, so, surprise, won't cost you anything. Uh, thank you very much.